Thank you, Pastor. We're going to turn to. Thank you, Geraldine. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Philippians as we continue on in our Sunday evening series. Chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4. Well, let's start at the first verse. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also have, but also for the interests of others. This particular passage, in my view, is probably one of the most relevant for our times. We live in a world of rights. Everybody has a right. And some of our uh, great sagacious leaders can find rights embedded in the Constitution that even the authors probably didn't know that were there. It's just an amazing thing to watch and to see. And at least there was a time when we could at least say these may be derived rights, but these are right in there. And if you happen to have the magic goggles on, you can see them. And so much of this really has been going on for uh, some time. It picked up a lot of momentum in the 60s when particularly there was the movement for what we would call freedom. Remember, all of the institutions were not to be trusted. Uh, people who were 30 years of age or older were not to be trusted, and all of those guys who were saying those things are well over 30 now, and I don't know what happened to them. I, if they no longer can trust one another because they turned 30, I was always amazed by it anyway, that when you turned a magic number, all of a sudden the, your integrity went out the window. I think they had maybe a, a little better explanation than that, but um, that's my tongue-in-cheek at them anyway. And we still live by this business of rights. And all of a sudden, there's hardly any sense of responsibility at all. The idea oftentimes is you have the right to do anything you want, particularly if you can get away with it, which is actually a conceptual contradiction. If you have to get away with it, then you probably don't have the right. And if, in fact, that is what is being said, and it's true, then the fundamental principle of our life is the principle of power. If you have the power to pull it off, you have the right to do it. So power and right then become something synonymous or very close together. And in a world of rights, the Christian recognizes the value and the reality of responsibilities. And notice how the Bible really speaks on responsibilities. Those of you who are with us this morning, notice the responsibilities that are ours because of love. And notice they aren't really just hammered on there. The idea just seems to be that where there is true love, there will also be these responsibilities. And Paul speaks in terms of responsibilities as well. And we have the responsibility of attitude. We have the responsibility of action. And we have the responsibility of appropriation. And we'll talk about that a, a little bit more. But right now, let's look at the responsibility of attitude. Our responsibility must be complete. It must be totally in place. And then, after it is in place, then it must be consistent. And what we mean by complete, what if you were to go out and to buy an automobile, and that automobile was being presented to you uh, as an eight-cylinder machine? And you buy the car, and you go home, and it just seems to be very sluggish. And all of a sudden, you open the hood, and you find that this V8 engine really only has four cylinders. Uh, but it still has a couple of holes up there where, where you can put in four more, two on this side and two on that. 
So it is a conceptual V8, but it's not complete. Aren't you glad that I have these really nifty pictures to illustrate? I should put together a book of Furrow's illustrations, and they will be about as well known as I am. But you can think of anything like that. When we speak of completion, we think of something that has met the blueprint standard and that it is up and ready to go. But that raises the next point. Now that it's ready to go, how will it be utilized? And the question comes back, it must be utilized consistently. So let's look at this then, it must be complete. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. We must always be of the same mindset, the same attitude. There's a tremendous emphasis placed upon diversity, and when you grow up in churches that are basically congregational governed, uh, the idea seems to be that a congregationally governed church is basically a democratic church uh, that has been baptized and goes to church every Sunday. That isn't quite the case at all. And what is the case is that we are all responsible to make sure that we are of the same mindset, the same attitude, that there is the same disposition for the living of the life, for the walking of the walk, for the talking of the talk. And that means we must have the same focus. We must know who we are, we must know why we're here, and we must know how we are to go about it. Because we do need to keep in mind that God has given to us a way to live our lives as well. We've kind of been using this along the way. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. But then notice what follows. For we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. We are created for good works in Christ Jesus, and we are created for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Notice that salvation is not just deliverance from sin, unbelief, and condemnation. It is not a deliverance from eternal separation from God, uh, perpetual condemnation in hell, and deliverance unto the greatness and the glory of the kingdom. Notice that we are also delivered unto a lifestyle that is to be lived even as we speak. And that's what our focus should be on. We must have the same focus. We must know the kind of life that God has called us to live. And there are the major points and there are the minor points. And we have to be sure that we major in the majors and minor in the minors. We don't turn it upside down. Oftentimes we find people who will quibble and they'll argue right down to the last breath over things that are secondary issues and should never be a consideration at all. And on other occasions, some of the big issues just go by the board. So we must have the same focus and that same focus then is Christ honoring. When Paul says, make my joy complete, it needs to be understood that when the believer's lifestyle is complete, at that point, Paul's joy can be complete. As he looks at the different elements that should be a part of the believer's life, and if they are all there, and if they are all there functioning well, then his joy is complete. But if only three out of the four are met, his joy is three quarters the way met, so to speak. And that's why we've gone ahead to say there is the responsibility of attitude, and that attitude must be complete, and it must be online as well. It must be well focused, and it must be consistently lived and applied. Always have the same love. Notice, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, the same high quality, the same love that is the biblical love, the love that we were talking about this morning, a love that is committed to the other person, a love that is committed to the other person who is not the best friend, 
a love that is committed to the other person who is indeed the enemy, a love who is committed to another person who doesn't care that you love them. That's the kind of love that we're talking about. And we are to maintain that. And it's to maintain that love even in the face of contempt and disregard. And there must be a union of the mindset. And that must be consistently in place. By maintaining the same love and always being united in spirit. And notice being intent on one purpose. That isn't always easy to do. And sometimes we will applaud diversity. But diversity is nothing but the balkanization of the life of the church. We need to have the unity of the faith, and that's basic. Notice that the responsibility of attitude is what makes Paul's joy complete. And you well know it. All of you here have served in churches sometime, someplace, even as you do so now. And it is surely a lot easier to serve the Lord together when everyone is on the same page. Don't you agree? Amen. amen. That's about the loudest amen I've heard in a long time. And that's the way that it should be as well. But notice that there is the responsibility of action. Over the years, I have learned to place a bigger emphasis upon the interior life as opposed to the exterior life. And I am indeed of a part of that age group. That when we grew up going to church, there was a tremendous set, a list of things that you shouldn't do. And some of them were indeed biblical, and others were so derived uh, that they fairly well lost the biblical flavor. And there was a tremendous emphasis on do this, do that, do the other thing, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing. And sometimes I begin to ask the question, particularly when the emphasis was on the negatives, what is it that I'm supposed to do? I know what I'm not supposed to do, but what is it that I'm supposed to do? And sure enough, I actually found it in the Bible eventually. But notice that our actions must be consistent with the attitude and the motive. It's interesting to find out, and say particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where the emphasis is placed upon us as being God's trustees. And God requires us to be faithful. And that is a tremendous liberty if you think about it. We live in a society where everything has to be success-oriented by tangible terms, terms where your entire ministry is quantified. But how do you quantify a growing heart? How do you quantify a spirit that is maturing? How do you quantify the depth of love that a person has? You can't do that. But this is why, and God points out further in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, that we, we're free. We don't need to judge one another on these things. Because God is the one, and there comes a day when he lays open the very motives and the intentions of our heart. And it finally dawned on me that the motives and the intentions of my heart are more important than my actions, my physical actions. And here's why. My physical actions are the expression of the motives and the intentions of my heart. If I am able to act contrary to my motives and my intentions, I'm either insane or I'm one of the better hypocrites you've ever known. Consistency will basically say that one's observable conduct is an expression of the values and the purposes and the intentions that he holds in his heart. And that's pretty clear in the scriptures. And so I've come to understand that these are the things that are of the utmost importance to us. What is actually going on in my heart? Where many times the only ones who know are myself and the Lord. And so our actions must indeed be consistent. And that consistency will basically speak of the motives and the intentions of our heart. Notice, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Notice, do nothing 
based upon or that is derived from selfishness or empty conceit. Selfishness, above all else, is an attitude. Conceit is also an attitude. When all of a sudden I'm walking around thinking that I'm bigger than I am and I'm better than you, either you laugh yourself to death or your conceit gets all insulted because anybody in their right mind knows that you're bigger and better than I am. But notice, nothing should be done from self-centeredness. But notice the proper attitude, with humility of mind, that the mind needs to be sharp. And this is one of the other things that I've learned along the line, that oftentimes we have placed a tremendous emphasis upon the emotions. And I've come to understand you don't tamper with a person's emotions. And what we need to do is make sure that we are nourishing the mind. Is this not the, the real call that we see in Romans chapter 12? That we are present our bodies a living sacrifice? And how do we do this? By getting all emotionally worked up so we can jump around the church building on one leg? I don't think so. Been there, saw that. Doesn't work very well. And I'm not really trying to be critical of anybody. What I'm trying to do is to point out the seriousness of what oftentimes takes place when it is really contrary to God's word. That these things should take place the actions and the conduct that is observable is the expression of the heart and the mind. And we are called upon to renew the mind. And this is what it should be all about. I had a lady in the Palmdale Church, and no matter what I did, I could, I could tease her quite a bit, but she'd really stay hard core to her commitment. Pastor, I have devotions every morning. And so we talked about our devotions. And what it boiled down to it was, now God lead me to the passage today. Do not be like your fathers or your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord of their fathers so that he made them a horror as you see. Thank you for this blessed word. May I live by it today. And that was her devotions. Now, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but not by much. Trust me on that one that it's the real study, the true devotion, is when we hang in there with God's word until we get a clear understanding of what is being said by the author and what he means to convey to the reader. And the only thing that should be different is we are putting ourselves in the place of that first initial group of readers. And then when we understand that, then we say, how do I apply this to my life? And sometimes it doesn't apply. My very first church, I got there right around Mother's Day, and I preached this dynamic, spirit-filled message on mothers. And this lady walks out, and she says, I should have stayed home. I said, what? And she was like this. She was great. She was a, really a fabulous artist. She says, I should have stayed home. I said, why? She says, you had nothing there for me. Man, I am melting right away. This is probably about my first or second sermon as a pastor, and I'm getting hammered. And I says, well, what do you mean by that? And she says, I am an old spinster. I like it that way. I love my art, and I don't want some man around the house detracting me from my art. And now you gave me nothing today. I am just devastated. And finally, at a last grasp, before I went down, I said, but Hazel, surely you know somebody who's married and is a mother and you could share this passage of scripture. She threw her head back and walked out the door and I thought, I've been hooked. But that's my point, though, and it was a good one. Everything in God's word does not apply to us directly. But we are in a position to help someone to whom it will apply. And that's why we have to stand prepared with the right motive. 
Notice, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Nothing should be done selfishly because that will lead to strife. And when it leads to strife, the union of the unity of the spirit is gone. The kind of Christ-like love is gone. There is no oneness of intent or purpose. All things should be done out of humility. Be of the same mind, meaning the same mindset and attitude toward one another. And do not be haughty in your mind, but associate with the lowly. And do not be wise in your own estimation. That is true disaster. But notice all of these things should be done with the right attitude. And therefore, many things that are done that seem to be just fantastic. If we knew the heart, maybe those things were about as empty as the conceit that drove them to that action. So our actions must be consistent and people should be able to trust us on our actions. Notice our actions must be calculated. Sometimes you hear somebody tell you, well, I'm doing this because the Spirit of God tells me to do it. I would like to know something like that that goes down inside and I don't know anything about it. What proof are you going to offer that that is the Spirit of God? How do I know that that's not the spirit of self? And in that case, the first person who pulls the spirit of God trump card wins. Now that sounds perhaps uh, a little too caustic, but you guys have walked with the Lord for a long time. If you tell me that you have never run into that yet, uh, I've got a beautiful bridge that's not too far away, and I'll give it to you at half the price. For notice... Nothing should be done from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility. And do not merely look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. We must view others as our superiors, at least in terms of the importance of the moment. And this is the mind of Christ. When Jesus Christ said, and this is what we will see when we get past these verses and get into the great passage on the kenosis of Jesus Christ. This is the mind of the servant. And for you and me, this is the mind of the servant prince. And this is one of the difficulties that I think the church in America faces today. Once we get on to this business of self-help in the name of Jesus, what does that do to get us to look outside of ourselves and beyond ourselves to be put into a position to minister to other people? And it's basically been my observation that many times people who seem to be in the worst way and they're so absorbed by their own lives, they can just about implode. But if they can look beyond themselves and to see that there are people in need and recognize that perhaps what they have been going through qualifies them supremely to minister to other people. And this is why we must not be looking out just for our own interests. And that passage tells us that there are some interests that are valid. But once we start looking for our own interests only, then's when we are in difficulty. And we must be concerned with the interests of others, even the lowly ones. And that is a part of our call. That's who we are. When we have the right attitude, when it is mature, when it is complete, when it is consistently followed, the responsibility of action follows just as surely 
as a passenger car follows the engine of the train. And our actions must be consistent with our attitudes and our actions must be calculated. Notice thirdly the responsibility of appropriation. Now I really had to work hard to maintain something of the alliteration of attitude, action, and appropriation. But I really like the word appropriation because it speaks of setting something aside for a particular purpose. I cannot think of another word in the English language that is not used in theology that speaks so theologically as this word. What is sanctification? Isn't sanctification God setting us aside to be used for his purposes? We are a part of his appropriation package. And that's one of the reasons why I like this word. He has set us aside. He has sanctified us and set us apart. We are a part of it, the grand appropriation bill of the kingdom of God. But notice at the same time, when we look at this text, when he sets us aside, he also sets aside other things that we must use in terms of ministry. And those things we must appropriate properly. And that's what I want to look at. We need to be responsible to the gifts. I use broadly the term fellowship and then the term society. Because indeed these are a part of the gifts of providence and I take it that providence becomes the foundation or at least the stage upon which redemption is played out. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. There is indeed the fellowship of marriage. If the idea of fellowship speaks primarily of a bond, then certainly marriage comes under the title of fellowship. And especially if marriage is supposed to represent the bond between Christ and the church, then certainly we have at least theological reason for speaking of marriage in terms of fellowship. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now notice, and we will say this even though I know that you've heard it any number of times and by others besides me. It doesn't say that the husband is to pound his wife into submission. And it doesn't say that the husband sets out the terms of submission because when we look at the transitional verse prior to these, Paul says, be in submission one to another. And this term submission is a military term. It speaks of military personnel falling into order, following orders for the sake of the company, for the sake of the brigade, for the sake of the nation that's being protected and defended. And it means that each person needs to take their own responsibility in getting things properly aligned for the well-being of the group. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. If there is a greater responsibility, if I understand Ephesians 5 correctly, the greater responsibility is on the husband, not on the wife. I don't know any place where you find it that the, the scriptures say, wives, be in subjection to your husbands and, and love them as Christ loved the church. So if there's going to be any kind of disparity, the greater burden is on the husband, not on the wife. But yet when we look at this in context, each party is responsible to take the initiative to have everything come together so that the military may function as it ought to. There is the fellowship of marriage and there is the fellowship of the family as well. 
No, this is still on the marriage one. I'm not quite there yet. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Notice the disparity or the difference in language. And nevertheless, wherever these things take place, and we can find other passages, say, for example, in the pastoral epistles, where the older ladies are to teach the younger ladies how to love their husbands. But this is the fellowship of the marriage. And there should be the fellowship of the family. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Wherever there is honor and respect, there is a bond. In fact, honor and respect reflects the presence of that bond. And that bond can be broken not only by the children, but by the parents. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So many people in the United States who want to see a secular country find themselves flabbergasted at seeing what parents can do to their children. Such horrific things happen to the little ones. And there's nothing that makes a person more irate than to read the newspaper and see what a mother or a father has done to abuse the child. If these people were Christians and they were walking with the Lord, that child has the safest place that he or she will ever have in all of his life. And they are not to provoke the children to anger, but to bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. They're supposed to encourage them to rise to the standards and to live by the standards of God's will and God's word. There is not only the fellowship of marriage and the fellowship of family, but there is the fellowship of God's people. Notice how people always sing so very well as we sing about the greatness of being a part of the family of God. That has just a natural ring to it, doesn't it? The language of the family. And it is great to be a part of the family of God because many times the family of God is everything that the natural family is not. And the family of God is there to encourage the natural family. And while we may fairly well have our kids out the door, it still does not mean that we cannot remind them of who they are and what they are about. And they were continuously devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. All of you recognize that this is one of the earliest descriptions of how the church functioned in the book of Acts. And notice, they ate twice over. I always get tickled because we have one person here who, when I first got here, actually kept count for a year the number of times this church got together for a meal. And he thought it was a terrible thing. He says, these people, do you realize that you get together, and I think it was 70 some times out of the year. And I was very serious. I said, yeah, some of the best food you could ever get too. I remember when I first came here, some of you who were here when we were still over in the foundation building, I was amazed. We'd, we'd have that tremendous uh, table spread before us and people were back there eating like crazy and then they'd stop at the door and say, Pastor, I can't talk to you now. I'll talk to you tonight, but we've, we've got reservations down at one, at one of the restaurants around here. And back in 2000, you pretty well had to go across the Agua Fria Bridge if you didn't go to Luby's. And they said, we'll talk to you tonight. And I went home and I laughed and I told Alice, I said, this is the eatingest church I've ever seen in my life. They sit down, they talk together, they, <clears throat> they fellowship and they have some pretty good f food there. And then they get up and go out and eat with their friends. And we've been doing it ever since. And this guy who kept count, it just now dawned on me, I don't think he kept count of the number of times the people went out to eat together after they ate at church. That would put it up well over 100 times. <clears throat> 
not to count some of the uh, other things, I suppose. And he would get so worked up, and I'd finally say, there are two things here. Number one, nobody's holding a gun to your head. You don't have to stay. And even if you do stay, you don't have to eat. Well, I still think, well, okay, good enough. But remember, you don't have to do this. But notice that this is what the early church did. There is something about gathering around a table that relaxes and allows you to have some fellowship that you could never have in another way. So, Roger, thank you for the goodies. And I didn't preach on gluttony today. They got together. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. Now, to, to be at least honest, there are those who take the term the breaking of bread to mean the communion service and only the communion service. I don't see it that way. They did have a love feast, you know, and wherever they had the communion service, they would have a love feast where they'd sit down and they would have their equivalent of a potluck dinner. It had a serious side to it. Uh, the serious side being that many times the people were really pretty poor and this was about the only real meal that they were going to get. So it was more than just party time in the name of the Lord. But I take it that it was actually sitting down and eating together. Was Jesus accused of being a recluse? What was he accused of? He was accused of being a wine-bibber and a glutton, wasn't he? And one of the worst kind of slanders to deal with is somebody who takes the truth and then expands it out so it no longer represents the facts. Jesus was always at meal with believer and unbeliever alike. But he did not go to meal and eat and drink in such a way that he violated any rule of propriety, that he violated any rule of self-control and moderation. And there is a commitment to the marriage, to the family, and to the people of God. And they devoted themselves to apostles' teaching. We should be men and women of the word. We should seek and strive as best we can to even understand some of the theological principles. One, one professor said one time in another setting, he said, you can ask all of your people whether or not they believe in the Trinity, but if you ask them to define the Trinity, can they do it? And that's a hard one. And we can say that again about the person of Jesus Christ being truly God and truly man. And, of course, the big hot issue in our generation is, does Jesus come before, during, or after the tribulation? My answer simply is this, that until you know what the issue is, you really don't have a position to stake out. And that's one of the reasons why I don't deal, basically, with hot issues from the pulpit. Not at least on that. If we want to sit down with some kind of a book or a study guide that lays out what the positions are. Here's A, B, and C, and here's why people believe A, and here's the argument against it. I'll do that. But otherwise, I won't. But that means that we should at least know the Word of God, and we need to know that theology is more than just patching some scripture verses together. Theology will lay out what some of the positions are, but they need to build bridges. And sometimes they need to put islands in place to put the bridge there. And that's where you really have to pay attention. But let's continue to be men and women of the word. Because no matter what is going on in the churches today, what is not going on is men and women who strive to know the word in depth. And one must be committed to society. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. 
We touched on this this morning, so we'll not do a whole lot tonight except to say, notice that there is a comprehension, a comprehensive commitment to doing good to those who are not a part of the family of faith and especially to those who are a part of the family of faith. And in the doing of good, we do so for the salvation of the unbeliever and for the glory of God. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Paul makes reference to the fact that we are the only gospel that some people are to read. It is our responsibility to know the written word well enough that the written word becomes alive in our minds. And so we are walking, talking expressions of the gospel. If we would spend as much time getting to know God's word, I'm speaking of the church in general, not just this, con this con congregation. We probably wouldn't have to be handing out four spiritual laws. Or if we were handing out four spiritual laws or the Roman road or whatever the favorite one is, we stand prepared to amplify what is said there. Oftentimes when those pamphlets are given out, the person is not ready yet. And the person may, at least in human terms, not be ready until they get to read the gospel in flesh and blood. And notice this is exactly what Peter is talking about. To keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, not the verse in the Bible that calls you to do that deed, but the deed itself, that they will glorify God in the day of visitation. And some take the day of visitation when Jesus Christ comes. Others take the day of visitation to mean when the Spirit of God visits them and convicts them of their need for salvation. And that's the one where I hang my hat. To the Christian, to be Christian not only means that we're deliberately in fellowship with Christ and his people at all times, it also means that we are consciously and deliberately out of step with the anti-Christian nature of the times. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice the difference, the distinction between conformity to the world and non-conformity to the will of God or conformity to the will of God and non-conformity to the world. In 1 John chapter 2, the world is passing away and also all of its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. How many times have we heard along the way if you do this, you're worldly. If you do that, you're carnal. If you do this, you're really carnal, and we don't even know for sure that you're saved. If somebody calls a person worldly by biblical standards, that person is saying that the one being called a worldling is not saved. And somebody better really have the evidence to make that statement stick. Because if we went on into 1 John, what we would find out is simply this, that the love of the world, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, notice all that is interior. That goes on in the soul. The lust that's generated by the flesh. The lust that is generated by the eyes. And the vain boastings of the biological life. That's what the worldliness is. It's what goes on in the heart. And then it comes out. But John goes on to say, 
that the person who has the love of the world, the love of the Father, is not in him. And we would therefore really be smart to back off on calling anybody worldly. Because when we start getting to the point where we're saying indirectly, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is not saved, that is saying a whole lot. And just to basically use another word that doesn't sound like a synonym, conceptually, it is a synonym. And we need to encourage one another, that's for sure. But let's be sure that we stay deliberately in fellowship with Christ and his people at all times. And let's be sure that we are consciously and deliberately out of step with anti-Christian nature of the times. And we willingly do this since we confess that the times are passing away, but the fellowship of the kingdom of God is everlasting. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, may we be people who have a responsible attitude and have taken care to be responsible in our action and that we take responsibility for the appropriations that you've given to us by your love and by your grace. May we do all things well to your glory, to the glory of your Son, by the power of your Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.